My favorite part of that Star Wars one is the is the the Chewbacca voice they do is kills me. Yeah, yeah. The Chewbacca animation is pretty funny too. Yeah. The part where Vader take, goes into the uh, ship at the beginning and starts smearing them against the walls. Yeah. This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to Spotcast, Season 6, Episode 55. It's the season finale of Season 6. Finally, it's arrived. Yay! Woo-hoo. My name is Timothy. I am in Toronto, Ontario. Yeah, I am Toronto, Ontario. No, I am in Toronto, Ontario. And I'm also joined by Jonathan Kuline, who is who is Mississauga, Ontario. I am Mississauga. Hello there, kids. All right, yes. And once again, time is traveling the world, so you'll have to listen to this like the rest of you and shake his fist. Anyway, um, quick fact check from last week. The show I couldn't remember the name of was The Enterprise Incident, which is I'm surprising I couldn't remember that. That's the one where I was talking about the tropes of, uh, you know, the the uh, strange new roles doing the Vulcan, turning mm-hmm. into Vulcans. Well, this is the one where he goes in and has his ears and his eyebrows surgically altered to make him look like a Romulan mm-hmm. Kirk. Uh, and that's when so uh, Spock is down being wooed by the female commander. And, and she's trying to get him to join, you know, and, and bring all, all his Starfleet, Starfleet secrets with him. Meanwhile, Kirk dresses up as a Romulan commander and goes and steals the uh, the cloaking device, which is what the whole purpose of that particular, that's what the Enterprise incident is. And that's it. So we'll jump over to the headlines and Jonathan's got a few and I got a few. Mm-hmm. So what you got? Yeah, we'll uh, we'll start off with some Star Trek stuff, but unfortunately, some sad Star Trek stuff. So, uh, the actress Patty, I'm gonna say this right, Patty Yasutake died this week uh, of cancer. Um, she is not somebody I think we know by a household name, but she's somebody who definitely had uh, a big role in the Star Trek: The Next Generation. She played Nurse Ogawa who was sort of the second in command to the medical bay, along with Dr. Crusher and Dr. Pulaski. She appeared in 16 episodes of the show, although if you'd asked me, I would have said more, uh, just because she was one of those very familiar faces. She sort of started off as a, you know, a couple of lines here and a couple of lines there. But then, you know, towards the end of the run, she definitely had some more uh, appearances. She's also two of the movies, I think, too, right? Yeah, she was definitely a, a, a presence, for sure. Um, yeah, she was in Generations, and um, yeah, she um, and First Contact. She was definitely a face that we knew, and uh, was definitely. It's funny because you know, in the era of Lower Decks, she was part of that original. I was going to say Decks she episode. was a Lower Deck person, right? Yeah, yeah. She was. She was. She was in that episode titled Lower Decks, where the was the inspiration, obviously, for the concept of these are the people who kind of run things when the rest of the main crew are doing other things, and. Uh, yeah, she was definitely one of those people that was a, a recognizable face for, for Star Trek fans for a number of years, and uh, obviously very sad to hear that she's passed away. Uh, but I will say, and uh, I've got it in our show notes, so please have a look. There's a lovely piece on Star Trek.com this week about how the character of Dr. Oga- or Nurse Ogawa uh, paved the road for uh, Asian American women and talked about just her role and how it evolved and how she was a strong character and yeah it was just it's a really nice piece by uh the the, uh, writer's name is christine din and just sort of highlighting that this you know representation matters and that this was an important role in 1987 there weren't a lot of you know good representations she was a very small minority of of uh star trek characters were asian and so it was really nice to see that she uh, got some recognition out of that so yeah um obviously very sad to hear of her passing but uh but what a, a nice tribute they've got up on their site right now definitely mm. recommend you have a look at that cool. yeah good she will be missed mm-hmm. certainly certainly a reg- like a regular character that you know even like you said it doesn't she doesn't jump out but you you kind of expect she was like a fixture in the yeah. in the medical bay absolutely yeah. absolutely all right uh, moving on to something we will definitely talk about as we get to the main part of our show, House of the Dragon. The news came out this week that House of the Dragon is going to be a four-season show. 
So as they wrapped up their second season, and we will talk about that in a few minutes, they have announced that they're going to do season three starting next year. They're going to start filming. So the expectation is we're going to see season three come in 2026 and then probably season four in 2028. And that will be the entire sum total of the uh, the Targaryen Civil War. So... Wrap your head around the fact that we have now watched 18 episodes of this series, and that is half. And there's also in this story that uh, I've pulled from Variety, it mentions that the expectation, though not confirmed, is that the episode count from this season will be the episode count going forward. So instead of oh, really? 10 hmm. episodes and then 8 and going forward, to, we were kind of hoping, I think, that it would go back up to 10. They seem to be thinking that it's going to be another 8 and then another 8. Although, in fairness, those episodes were decently long. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in our main part of the show about some of the reasons behind that, because it kind of ties into the season finale and what we got there. So stay tuned. And it's going to work out nicely, too, because they're uh, the teaser trailer that HBO aired on Sunday night with House of the Dragon season two finale highlighted that in 2025, we're going to get um, the second House, uh, sorry, Game of Thrones spinoff series um, that is coming and it's going to be coming in 2025. I think the idea would be that basically there'll be a new show every other year from the sort of game of thrones universe which i guess probably makes much more sense because right now we have to we're essentially we're, we're looking at like multi-year gaps right mm-hmm, right but uh night of the seven a uh, night of the seven kingdoms which is based on the books uh the novellas tales of duncan egg is going to fill in that gap. So in 2025, we'll get the first season of that. 26, we'll get season three of House of the Dragon, and then it'll go back and forth for a few years. They're also working on other projects. I think this is just part of the long game that HBO's in the Game of Thrones business, and they're just going to keep churning out shows. So yeah, if they're only going to do four seasons of one, that's fine, because they'll probably do another four seasons of something else as soon as it's done, right? Right, yeah. Nope. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Might as well keep milking it. Yeah, wow. Well, milking those, milking those dragons. I mean, I think part of HBO's subscription model is based on the fact that they are going to keep turning out Game of Thrones shows. But I mean, it's funny. Like the the, I mean, the one comment about I don't know about well, maybe we can talk about it during the during the, the our review of the season. I guess is 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 and this is a quite I guess a big question for you because I don't usually bring up a big question, but um. Is the the political intrigue in um, House of the Dragon as strong as the political intrigue in in the uh, Game of Thrones was? You know, yeah. I mean, I don't think so. Just because there's fewer players. Like the best part of Game of Thrones was the fact that you know everybody seemed to have their eye on the prize. And the metaphor for the show is you know that it's a game that people are playing this game and you either play to win or you die. And so that made the stakes of the show very high. And there was a lot of different suitors for it. In this case, it's kind of column A and column B, which kind of minimizes the stakes a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's more personal because it's family, right? Yep. Yep. Okay, this one, I would like you to reach down and hold onto your socks for they may fly off your feet, Tim. The Orville! Remember that? Remember the Orville? Remember when we used to yeah, talk about the Orville? Uh, there was like three, only three episodes in the last season that I <laughs> managed to... Uh, yeah, I think you made I, it one I, more I than like, I, I don't think I made it through the third episode, to be honest with you. I think it's just still frozen on my Apple TV going, hey, remember remember us? <laughs> I feel bad about this because Jaime's not here to defend the Orville, which he was definitely much more into <laughs> than the two of us. But I, I think, well, I don't know. I think, I, I think well, I, I think I can speak for Jaime when, when I say... I don't think it, it delivered on what the promise was, right? And and I think he agreed with that. Last time, last time we talked about the Orville, it kind of, you know, it kind of just fell flat on its face. But well, in spite yeah. of all that, there is still a fan base that are hardcore. Of course, that I they mean, people, think... people like um, Galaxy Quest too, right? Sure, so. sure. And you know, I'm not going to begrudge people their fandoms. Uh, it wasn't for me, but that's fine. Uh, that being said, it has been a long time since we've seen anything from the Orville world. So it came as quite a surprise this weekend when Scott Grimes, uh, who is one of the actors on the show, was at an event at Star Trek Las Vegas, and he confirmed that filming on season four of the Orville will begin in either January or February of next year. Now, this hasn't been confirmed elsewhere that I've seen, 
but he did make this a public announcement. So yeah, I think we now wait to see if there's a formal announcement forthcoming. That's it's a big gap. I think it's been like three years since the last time they did anything related to the Orville. Now, obviously, uh, Seth MacFarlane's got a lot on his plate. He has multiple shows. He's working the movies. He's, you know, all kinds of stuff. But that's a big gap. So it'll be interesting to see what they decide to do for Because even if you'll recall, the gap between season two and three was a bit. And they decided to, to dub it New Horizons because they were kind of like, oh, it's a new it's a new iteration. So this will be like New New Horizons or new Newer Horizons. The next generation, maybe? The, the next next uh, horizon. But uh, yeah, so stay tuned, kids. If you were a fan of the Orville, it uh, it might it might be on its way back. Yeah, yeah. I know you're excited, yeah. Tim. Calm down. Calm well, down. Well, I mean, it was, it was, to be honest with you, it was a bit sterile, but I guess that's the kind of, that's the kind of look they were going for, right? So. I mean, they were trying you know. to capture some of the magic of old Trek, and I appreciate what they were going for, but it was neither... It was neither funny enough to be a comedy nor engaging enough to be a great sci-fi show for my taste. It, it felt very derivative. Um, if they had really leaned into the humor, I think I like when they did lean in hard on the humor, I enjoyed it more. But it, it just felt like it was kind of stuck between worlds and it never really landed for me. Now, again, your mileage may vary. You may enjoy it very much. And here's your here's your enticement. It may be coming back. Uh, Now, where it's going to air might cost you a couple more bucks because (laughs) Disney is hiking the prices across the board. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Throw him to the floor. Uh, Disney is hiking prices across the board on Disney Plus, Hulu and ESPN Plus standalone plans, as well as most bundles. This is an article from Variety. I have not seen how this is going to affect Canada. I I can't imagine if they're going to do this in the States, they wouldn't do it here as well. These price increases are obviously, for the purposes of this, only in the United States. I am waiting for a note to be coming coming my way from the good folks at uh, Disney Plus about how that's going to affect us here. But uh, yeah, the they, term that they are using is streamflation. Streamflation is a real thing. Uh, they are just constantly, seemingly milking more and more out of this thing. Uh, I did think it was very funny timing-wise they, they uh, announced this. And they also announced that uh, for the first time ever that the Disney Plus model is a profitable enterprise. They announced that at a shareholders meeting this week. So um a large, if you'll join me in a large salute, middle fingers up to the good folks at Disney for <laughs> simultaneously doing that. Uh, yeah, they announced this on Tuesday and on Wednesday they announced on their Q3 uh, earnings call that they, they are, in fact, now a profitable enterprise doing Disney Plus. So, uh, and that's out of your pockets and mine. So, yes, enjoy. And the Hulu and the Max, they were they were acquired sometime in the last little while. Well, Disney, is it? Hulu, or merged or whatever. Hulu, they had a third of, but they acquired a majority share when they bought Fox. Because okay. Fox had another portion of that. Uh, and then they, I believe, acquired the last portion of that uh, sometime after that. So that is now all theirs. ESPN is part of their ownership of ABC Television and ESPN um, that they've had for a long time. So. Again, this is just corporate synergy, really. Disney Plus is something people are subscribing to. They're bundling it with Hulu and ESPN Plus in the States and and making it a thing, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, it's approaching, when you get into the, the uh, higher-end bundles, it's approaching cable pricing, you know? It is. It is. Absolutely, yeah, it so. is. And, you know, of course, the, the way that they're enticing us now is, well, you know, you can have it cheaper, but we're going to add in commercials. Well, you can have it cheaper, but, you know, you get lower quality. Oh, you know, so you have to decide what your priorities are. I know um, uh, the Amazon Prime subscription that I use is um, they, they, now that tier is is commercial. So they show commercials at the beginning, usually in the middle a few times, and then at the end of things, um, which is very jarring because that's a new thing that they introduced. And it's basically like, well, if you don't want to pay us an extra whatever it is, three, four dollars a month, you get to watch commercials. So, right, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I've been on the threads a lot more than Twitter these days. I spend more time. I, for some reason, the content on, on threads is much nicer better friendlier less i I don't think i've heard of very many um you know negative like bad things happening on threads like they do on twitter you know like if you put an opinion up on twitter 
chances are you're going to get some flaming from people. I think it could be it could be because the the whole thread things it, threads is, is kind of a walled garden too, isn't it? Like run by by Meta and all that. It stuff? is, yeah, or, it's, and it's affiliated yeah. with your Instagram and, and everything else. Yeah, so I think I think there's a lot of there's a lot of like. Uh, back background checking on things that goes on, so you may not see some of the negative comments anyway. But so, but I have discovered a few people that I started following on Threads that I just sort of they randomly came up in the feed and started following them. One of them is Jason Pargan, and he's a, an American r- reporter, writer, opinion guy, um, and he does these little you know TikTok type videos. And this one was interesting, and I reason why I flagged it for our show is he was talking about in this in this particular TikTok that I've got listed here um, how people who don't like Star Wars like to say that it was ripped off from Flash Gordon, and we've talked about this before on the show. Like like one of my problems with the whole renaming of the fourth episode four is that it was to me it was kind of like like. George Lucas discovered this lost reel of the serial and here's episode four. Like, you know, I, I often would jump into Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon in the middle and, you know, and kind of like just, you know, you'd, you'd miss the first couple ones. And I know that drives some of the completionists crazy, but you, you know, you kind of got what you got, right? You would go to the, you would go to the theater to watch a movie and it would, it would either open with a cartoon, you know, Bugs Bunny or something like that, Looney Tunes, or it would open with like a, a reel from one of the serials that you, and that it was in a way of getting people to come to the theater more regularly, right? And so to complete the complete the episodes. But anyway, so he talks about how well, of course, Star Wars was ripped off from Flash Gordon. In fact, that George Lucas even tried to buy the rights to, to Flash Gordon and was tur- turned down by the estate or whoever owned it. So he went back and rejigged, you know, his original script to, to turn it into Episode Four. And uh, but then what's interesting about Flash Gordon is it was also ripped off from Buck Rogers, which was a famous comic at the time. Right. And and same sort of idea. There were Buck Rogers films as well, I believe. And but Buck Rogers was ripped off from Edgar Rice Burroughs, Princess of Mars, (laughs) surprisingly enough. And uh, which was also a ripoff of Gulliver of Mars. I've forgotten the author for that one, but the Gulliver from Mars, Gulliver of Mars, was was so badly received as a piece of science fiction that the author never wrote another piece of fiction again. Wow! Right? Yeah. So it's interesting to sort of you know, and and you know, we've all talked about the if you if we've all dug into the the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell sort of story. This is the typical you know kind of thing, and a lot of we see these kind of. Stories come up all the time, you know, like, and you can, you can literally replace Harry Potter with Luke Skywalker with, you know, um, anything that the guy who did the uh, Look Justice League, what's his name again? Um, that director. Zack Snyder? You know, Zack Snyder, yeah. He yeah. does a lot of the, all that kind of stuff, too. I mean, well, even, you know, Planet of the Apes are all, they're all sort of the same, you know, hero's journey kind of, kind of stuff, but. Yep. Yeah, so it's just an interesting, an interesting piece. So I'm gonna, I keep watching him. His he, uh, Jason Pargan, and a couple of other. Uh, there's a couple of. There's one um, physicist lady that I watch who does really interesting stuff, and, um, and with tongue firmly planted in cheek a lot. And another one who does astrology or, or not astrology, cosmology, which is kind of fascinating too, right? So. Hmm. Yeah, so that's a kind of an interesting thread. But uh, I was telling Jonathan just before we started recording today, we discussed Borderlands, which has now, I guess it's now hit the theaters. And um, what what caught my attention, and the reason why I brought it here, is I wanted to point out that by, when I saw this this afternoon, that Borderlands had risen its Rotten Tomato scores by eight points, starting from zero. <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah as as we record it's at six so i mean you know <laughs> yeah it uh i think we talked about it there have been some uh initial reviews that have come out and it is scathing um i i watched the trailer i i must admit i've never played the borderlands games uh it just wasn't my cup of tea but i know they're very popular and i know that there is a fan base for this and and maybe it'll persevere but uh yeah the, the reviews some of the words that i've seen in the the initial review headlines have been you know disastrous uh unwatchable you know it's it's that's yikes that's that's harsh so uh, i think we'll we'll see how this one goes this might be one of those ones that uh that our fans on uh on slack will recommend that i have to watch to endure yeah. uh as it comes out sometime in the near future i'm sure on streaming so i, I kind of get the impression remember tank girl i think that was another one that was kind of oh i, think I love it, tank girl come on do you it's based okay, on a comic that's a good it. one yeah well the book comic's good i know that comic's but i gotta great. go back and watch 
Yeah. You got to go back and watch that one. Cause I, I remember that being sort of a kind of a weird. It was certainly, sort of it was, I feel like it was a bit ahead of its time, but it was also, it was super yeah. weird, but then so was the comic. Well, it's so. like Howard the Duck too. It's kind of just a very different thing and people weren't really, it wasn't Howard the Duck, one of the first Marvel movies to be made kind of thing. It or? was one of the first big Marvel movies to be made because up until then there was sort of the Roger Corman campy mm-hmm. silly ones. This one had George Lucas involved. Like it was Mm. It was a big deal when it happened. It's just it did not seem to land with many people, which is a shame because, uh, as you know, I love it. So, yes, yes, we know you love it. Get the poster on the wall and everything. I do. An original one sheet. Wow. All right. Yeah. So cool. Well, and that brings us to the uh, the main part of the show where we're going to talk about the season finale of season two season finale of House of the Dragon. Um, yeah, it does feel like we didn't get enough, uh, episodes out of this one, but then that's also because of the, like you mentioned last week, the writer's strike. So mm-hmm. the queen who ever was, mm-hmm. the title means, what? well, the, the queen who never was, was what they called princess, uh, Renice, uh, who of course was next in line. She should have become the next ruler of the seven kingdoms but because she was a woman she was denied and her cousin ended up taking her place that was Viserys who was Rhaenyra's father and of course as she was the queen who never was in this one we see sort of this upswell of support around Rhaenyra we see a lot of people bending their knee to her and so she is the queen who ever was uh, my elevator pitch for this one was budget smudget. Where is the war that you promised us? <laughs> um, yeah, it. We knew that there was some restrictions. Well, do, do I get to give my elevator? pitch? Oh yes, please. Yes, yes, absolutely. So my elevator pitch is is is, is sort of around a simple uh, simple part of the show, but it, it's all fun and games until your wife comes home. <laughs> yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And then you will too bend the knee. Yes, you will bend the knee. That's for sure. Um, it, it, it was it, it. So this season was shortened from. I planned 10 episodes to eight episodes and I have read online and heard from the, the showrunner Ryan Condal that there were also budget cuts that came with that. So they Mm. kind of had to pick their spots a little bit over the course of what they wanted to do in this truncated and uh, financially restricted season. But yeah, I would, I would expect the torching of that, that city was probably one of the things they cut right from the special effects budget. Yeah, I mean, they they kind of worked around a few things. You know, we got some really cool stuff this season. We got the big dragon battle in, in episode four. We got, you know, some some really good looking stuff, considering that they, they did say there were some limitations. I don't feel like what we got was bad at all. But what we didn't get is really what the issue is. So this is now 18 episodes in 16 episodes to go and we have not seen one major battle yet now this episode does its very best to get you psyched for those things and i'm sure when you go back and watch it as one big binge of four seasons of it i'm sure it'll be fine but when you get to the end of this season and the whole thing is just more people talking at each other and dragons in the background And no actual battles, even though this has been promised as, you know, the Dance of the Dragons and the Civil War between the Targaryens. And this is a whole thing. We went through this whole episode. It was a good episode. There was lots of good things to like out of it. But all they did was set the stage for a bunch of stuff that is coming. And ultimately, I'm not sure that's satisfying. Yeah. Well, that's what I sort of said to you on the weekend. It was kind of a, uh, what was the term I used? (sighs) Yeah, it, it'll come back to me. But it's just it just sort of it went out with a whimper, you know, what I mean, kind of yeah. thing, right? Like, yeah, well, it's it's a good uh, indication that for my best pew 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 for this episode, I had not applicable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe maybe the guy with the bad manners at the uh, at the table was the, the one guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more little birds. Yeah. Yeah. And the queen is talking. Yeah. When yeah. the queen stands up and holds her glass, maybe don't ask for more food. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and again, I I don't want to I don't want to get too hard after it. I think yes, it was disappointing we didn't get especially because they have been building up. All these armies have been marching. They they've been over and over again telling us, "Oh, well the the uh 
high towers are coming from here and the Lannisters are coming from here and the the Northmen are coming from here and that they made these deals and these armies are all converging and and you know oh and we've got more dragons in the mix now and they just kept hyping it up and then we're basically like oh and we've got the sea battle ready to go and we've got oh we've got this land battle ready to go and oh this dragon's ready to take on this dragon and i'm like cool stop talking about it and show it to maybe, me maybe maybe the writers should go watch the napoleon movie because i mean there's got to be five major battles in that movie i'm right? guessing the budget for that was pretty good too though yeah uh, probably about the same to be honest with you yeah yeah but a lot of cgi i'm sure but yeah and again, I don't want to take it away from the fact that we had some great moments in this episode. The scene where Rhaenyra finally sort of gets word that Damon and, and may be, you know, forming his own army as opposed to building an army for her. And she flies in on her dragon and goes to Harrenhal, Hall and there's this room full of people and the queen walks into the room and no one bends their knee. And then Damon gives this little speech where he's like, I get it now. I get why but, you're but, here. But you forgot to say why he gets it. Well, that's, he's, yeah. Yeah, get to that. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that that scene was amazing. But you're right. It's it Basically, it's predicated on the fact that he finally, all of these little moments that he's been having, these these visions he's been having at Heron Hall have finally paid off. He gets taken down to the Weirwood Tree by Alice Rivers, and he gets basically a recap of, of the Game of Thrones eight season journey. If they'd show that to yeah. me, maybe I wouldn't have to watch eight, eight seasons of the show. Sure. Um, it's also particularly funny because he has this vision that includes Daenerys and her baby dragons, but doesn't seem to include Jon, uh, who is actually the prince who was promised and is actually the, the you know, the last Targaryen in the end. But uh, spoilers if you haven't watched Game of Thrones, but really, if you haven't, why are you listening to us talk about House of the Dragon? Anyways. Because um, <laughs> it's a Star Trek podcast. That's, you that's, not that's true. It is. <laughs> Welcome to Star Trek, House of the Dragon. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, it's uh, in the end, Damon finally realizes his place. He didn't believe in prophecy. He didn't believe that there was a greater purpose. He kind of just thought this was about the here and the now. Now he gets it. Now he is on board. And now he realizes exactly what Alice said, which is you are a player in this game. You are not the one playing the game. And that's important. That's an important milestone because now he's back on team black all of those forces are aligned he's got this army of rivermen all ready to go and as i said it's more stage setting so when when rhaenyra shows up and sort of says what have you been up to while i was away he says mea culpa my bad i'm actually here i'm on your team everyone in this huge room all bends the knee and you know uh after he bends his knee though yeah makes a big yeah. point of it right so again really good really satisfying for this you know, I think we talked about it in previous episodes. This whole thing with Damon and the and the Riverlands at Heron Hall is dragged out a lot. I feel like perhaps a little too much, but I'm glad that it, it at least ended in a satisfying way so that we actually get this payoff in the end. Um <laughs> other highlights of this episode. Well, uh the scenes of Tyland Lannister trying to recruit or uh, more more importantly give large amounts of real estate to the triarchy uh in exchange for them joining the efforts to break the sea oh, yeah, blockade. That was, good, yeah. that was probably the best pew pew the, the the mud battle. The mud wrestling was pretty good. Um yeah, I mean did we need to go there three times? Did we need to have all this stuff captured? I mean, I guess it's it's tricky. Because, you know, we talked about this. We're only going to get four seasons of this. We got eight seasons of Game of Thrones. It's truncated, so things are moving faster than we're used to, and yet slower than we're used to, because we kind of thought we'd get more pew-pew-pew in this season. But the fact that they took the time to introduce Lohar, uh, who is a trans character, which is cool, and have him be this character where you get to see what kind of person that he is, and you get to, you know embrace a little bit of this this triarchy culture and this different way of of viewing things in essos i think is gonna serve you well because obviously the way they're setting it up is that in the next season we're going to get this climactic battle at sea between the valarian forces uh of corliss and his son uh um adam to facing off against the triarchy right so they, they've kind of set the stage for that and so now you've got a little more investment where you're like, oh, well, Lohar's a fun, interesting character. Now I care a little bit more about what happens, but it's also, uh, you know, 
did I need that over one of any one of these battles actually happening in this episode? No, probably not. Hmm. Yeah. So Lohar is a, is a trans character? Yeah, I mean, Lohar is, is uh, just judging from appearances and uh, is, was, is biologically uh, born female, it, it seems. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see what you mean by that. Okay, but is you. presenting male and talks about his wives. So I'm, again, didn't, didn't take two plus two to get very far for me to get to four, uh, hmm. you know, as, as, as... Well, I would have used another term for it, but that's fine. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's good. It's good. It's good representation because they didn't beat it over the head, but um, it definitely, you know, paid off in some very uh, enjoyable scenes. This this scene uh, at the beginning, and then of course the scene with the mud wrestling, and then the the scene where uh, you know they're they're sitting around feasting and singing songs and stuff like that, which were all uh, you know again it was good. It was good. Some good humor mixed in there, and the the Thailand character is pretty hilarious. Uh, you know, anytime you can take the take the piss out of Thailand is is a funny one. He's the same one earlier this season who was uh, you know had to babys babysit the the princeling at at the uh, the council meeting in episode one, right? Um, you know, settle down, Thailand. Come on, we're trying to get work done here. You know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, again, I think there was a lot of stuff to to enjoy here. I thought the the sort of culminating or second second from last scene with uh another scene between Rhaenyra and Alicent, which I wasn't expecting. I don't think anyone was really expecting them to meet face to face again like this. Uh to have Alicent come to Dragonstone wearing her blue dress, not her green dress, wearing her blue dress, very important. Green is high tower, blue is the color that she wore when they were friends back when they would hang around the the uh the garden and read books and and eat lemon cakes. So, she comes back and basically says, you know, I've had an epiphany. My epiphany is this has to end. So, I'm willing to throw open the doors to King's Landing for you. If you, you know, agree to let me and my family live and Rhaenyra basically says, you know, you have gone too far, you know, you can't just have everything your way. So we even get Alicent agreeing that she can, uh, she's willing to sacrifice her son, the king. Is she though? Is she though? I mean, like, I mean, well, that's I what she says. She but then yeah. in the end, she doesn't seem to have control over that because one of the things we see in this very impressive, you know, five minute montage to finish the episode is sort of where everything's set up. So we see, you know, uh, we see Thailand and the Triarchy getting out to sea. We see Adam and Corliss going out to sea. We see the armies that are all marching. We see the, the Northmen crossing uh, at the the, uh, the river where the Freys are. We see Harrenhal. We see all these different setups. And and the young girl gets the big dragon, too. That's right. Well, she, she meets him anyways. Yeah. Um, well, she didn't get burned. So she, she didn't get burned are. yet. So that's good. So, yeah, she uh, so we see um, we see Raina meet Sheep Stealer and we y- y- also get uh, Aegon and um, Laris in the back of a cart leaving King's yeah. Landing. So they're yeah, they're yeah. pieced out. So right. it will be interesting to see how these things all come together as far as the next season. But they have done an, a, a masterful job of setting the stage. I just wish they had set the stage and delivered a performance before we bid them adieu at until 2026. Yeah, at least something, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's just it's such a long wait. It, it, like a dragon needs to fall, and then we just we have to wait till next season to find out what the result was. Like they like they did with with the king, you know, when he got toasted, right? Yeah, I just. It, 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 as I say, the stage is set nicely, and I'm sure uh, it's going to pay off. Uh, you know, I'll fast forward ahead to my big question. My big question is, is next season all crunch berries, which is to say, <laughs> are we finally just going to get banger after banger after banger of episodes? Are we going to get, you know, oh, there's this huge sea battle. Oh, there's this huge land battle. Oh, they, they fight for King's Landing. Oh, you know, Damon versus, you know, Aemon. Like, yeah, this is all if the show doesn't get canceled between now and then, too, wow, right? There's, you know? there's just no way. <laughs> just, just, this is their business now. The HBO's business model is we do Game of Thrones and some other stuff because this is what makes them the most eyeballs. So I don't think there's a risk of that. I think the bigger the the biggest risk is uh 
budget cuts because it's you know Ryan Condal was saying he's the showrunner was saying you know yeah we were dealing with some stuff that's why we had to sort of do what we did that's why we didn't do these things because again the next things they're going to do are yeah a massive sea battle a massive battle filled with extras and explosions and flames we're going to do this like you know all these different things that they've set up are all big budget stuff because you have to animate dragons you have to you know cast thousands of extras you have to blow up ships you have to you know all those things cost a ton of money to make and so i i think what we really need to hope for as fans is they don't skimp and they don't cut any more corners because this was a really enjoyable season that kind of as you said i think you nailed it tim it, it went out with a whimper mm-hmm. yeah um i did flag a couple of quotes which i i got some too yeah, yeah. Um, it's best to live, I think, however you do it. This is Laris talking to, uh, Aegon saying basically like, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't give up on anything yet. Don't you just, you, you don't want to die. Keep going. You don't have to die in your sword. Yeah. 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 Um, That's where it fall on your sword, I should say. The two best ones, and we didn't talk about the scene, but the scene between Kristen and Gawain was a banger because... Kristen is is sitting there sniffing the handkerchief that uh, that Allison pulled out of her breast, uh, you know, in the previous episode. And Gwen is like, "Ew, dude, that's my sister." And they have this, you know, uh, sort of scrap. And you realize just Kristen has become a much more interesting character since since the he saw the dragons fight. He, you know, he's much more like you know thinking deep thoughts and not just such a vacuous bugger but uh he got two bangers out in here perhaps all men are corrupt and true honor is is oh i must have gotten the word wrong perhaps all men are corrupt and true honor is a mist that melts in the morning and this is must a mist, mist that melts in the morning that was very eloquent beautiful writing by whoever did that for the show but my favorite by far is <laughs> desire for women has brought me grief after grief i feel like most men should have that tattooed on them somewhere yeah, the one I caught from the same speech was the the dragons dance and the men are just dust under their feet. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a metaphor for, you know, his his journey this season, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I got one from, from Matt Smith, too, when he, when uh, the dude comes to check on him. Mm. And he says, you know, we've been trying to get, get her to do what we want, but she won't. She keeps, you know, she's not listening to us, so maybe we'd be better off with you as a king. Uh, not in so many words, right? And and uh, Matt Smith looks in because I never suspected you as a turn cloak. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was yeah, a, a funny scene where they go down to the uh, the God's Wood and you hear the trees whisper, "Traitor." <laughs> what do they whisper? The trees, and when he goes down to the God's Wood, with, yeah, yeah, with, what, with, they whisper, "Traitor." Oh, do they? Oh. Yeah. Which is like, woof. You know, when the trees are calling you Did you hear that? Did you hear that? (laughs) Yeah. Did you hear the word traitor? Because it sounded like traitor. I did like in that scene, too, where everyone bends the knee because he's just like, you know, soiling his armor (laughs) because he's like, "Uh uh-oh, if she makes nice with him and and Damon and and Rhaenyra are back together... I'm gonna be in a pile of doo doo here. Yeah, he does. He does. He does bend his knee last, if I recall Mm. correctly. Right. So yeah, and that was after again, like I said, you know, the scene where the face off between Rhaenyra and and uh, Damon. He she's expecting him to say, you know, I've got an army and I don't need you, kind of thing. Whatever, Mm. I'm going to be the king and you're going to just be the queen or whatever. Yeah. Because at one point, I think in an earlier episode, he talks about that she would take her rightful place beside him. Right. Yeah, it's, that's how son. he had positioned himself until he had finally had this sort of breakthrough division. Yeah, division. The dragons. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, and and the white and the and the winter coming and uh, what was the name of that white guy? The the, the night the king. Night king. Yeah. Yeah. Once once he saw him. Yeah, I mean there was all kinds of little Easter eggs in there too. Mm-hmm. He saw the three eyed raven, so he saw you know right. that's of course something from Game of Thrones. He saw right. uh, you know the the Night King, and then he also saw you know Danny and the um, in the fire, yeah, in the fire, you know, with the baby dragons. And then there was a couple things. I'm they're they are book spoilers, but there was a couple more things if you go back and watch that scene that will will foretell the future. Um, uh, and not the future of Game of Thrones, but the future of House of the Dragons. So interesting stuff oh, really? in there. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I would recommend that if you have, I don't know, say two years to kill, that uh, 
that the uh, what's it called? Fire and Blood, the story of the Targaryens, is available mm. at your local bookstore and or on Audible and or on uh, any other. Well, when did he write that? Because he is he supposed to finish the House of the, you know, the Game of Thrones book? He is. So he wrote that a number of years ago, probably ten years ago. He wrote this. Uh, as just like an as a plan, as a sort of like 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 Asimov did, where you would build the universe. Yeah, this was more backstory. Basically, he had he had all kinds of backstory that he had written for the Targaryens, uh, you know, leading into Game of Thrones, and so basically he just packaged that as a history book, and then that yeah, because the, in blood. the Game of Thrones, there's that myth about Jon Snow's mother, right? So being the sister of the one guy, whatever. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of of sort of foretellings and prophecies and all kinds of stuff in in um in fire and blood that sort of foretell where this is all going for the targaryens over the course of time and everything but but that being said it's not a faithful adaptation one way or the other like the the show is doing things that aren't in the book and the book does things that aren't in the yeah. show the show has got a lot of that rashomon unreliable narrator stuff so i'm I tend to view the show as more of the like what really happened version as opposed to the skewed version because we we actually get like it actually says in Fire and Blood this was so and so this is how so and so recalled it happening this is how so and so recalled it happening after and, several after several meets right well so. that's it right so you yeah. know and of course everyone has their biases and whatever whatever so and everybody remembers things the way they want to remember yeah for sure so I think. The show, like these meetings that we've had multiple two two meetings this season between Alice and Rainier, and none of that's in yeah, the book. Yeah, they never happened in the book, right? But yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah. Like those two yeah. actresses are incredible together. They have so much chemistry, and they're such good actors that those scenes are amongst the best we've seen all season. It's you know, like I don't care that they aren't in the book. I, I think they they really enhance the story, and I think the way that they tie those two characters together is much more interesting to me than than some of the other accounts that are in the book. So, uh, yeah, if you want the broad strokes of what sort of where this is going or, you know, some more details in the stuff, there's lots of cool stuff in the book. Obviously, if you just want to enjoy the show for the show, yeah, we'll see in 2026. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. You know, I was thinking about that scene, the last scene with, with Rhaenyra and Alicent, where, like, having having watched the Queen of England, you know, Elizabeth throughout her career. And then and then having watched, you know, such shows like The Crown and other movies where they explore or they try to explore the House of Windsor, for example, in terms of how it works and how it ticks. And it's very much pomp and circumstance and mm-hmm. ceremony. And there's all kinds of documentaries about that too, right? But um, the way that, I mean, the way um, Rhaenyra reacts, you know, gets up out of bed in the middle of the night and goes and talks to to see this, you know, this secret visitor who showed up and turns out to be Alice. And the way she speaks to her is not how I would expect a royal to speak to somebody, right? Because once you become the head of state, you your your comportment is completely different, right? Yeah, you know. So and because I mean, I don't think other than the queen, you know, kind of like hanging out with her corgis and her kids, and when they went off to the to that um, castle in Scotland, what they used to go to, yeah, um, Windsor Castle. You no, know, sorry, Is that Windsor Castle. No, it's um. Oh crap! It'll it'll come back to me in a minute, but. There's a, there's a place. It's it's in the. If you watch the Crown show, it's all in there. And yeah. It's where they go off and they go hunting. And you know that the um, one of the one of the kids. I can't remember if it's um, Will or um, or Charles has to go hunt a big a big deer, a big buck. Yeah. You know, sort of rite of passage kind of thing, which only happens in like super super rich societies, well, right? Of course. Yeah, but I mean, but just kind of the way the you know the there's a lot of meetings in the Crown show. Um, and a lot of shows and if you watch movies about prime ministers in Britain about how the queen and the prime minister meet and, and talk about things, right? Cause she's the head of state and he has to come and report to her all the time. Right. Um, and kind of how the, the new, every time there's a new prime minister, he has to learn the protocol and all that kind of stuff, right? Like you never, you never turn your back on the queen, for example, you never, you never walk. You never like you don't stand up until she stands up. You don't like you know. There's a whole lot of rules around, and I mean, just, it, even if even if Alicent didn't respect Rhaenyra as 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 the the true queen, I think she does, right? Why else would she be there in that room? But um, you know how she how she responds to her as if she was as their two little eight year old kids again, right? Yeah, sort of thing, it's, right? it's tricky because they are obviously people who have known each other in the show since they were children. So I, I think there's part of that too. I think, I think you're onto something because 
they certainly seem to revert to themselves in in a much more basic way when they're together like they do see each other not always necessarily as they are but as they were and who they always have been to each other it's kind of interesting yeah and again, if this, if this, was, if this was a Hollywood, if this was a Hollywood movie, you know, about about a king and, and queens and whatever, she would have just said, "Seize her, yeah, <laughs> you know, lock her up, put her in the dungeon, put her in the tower, whatever." I mean, like, why, why does she let her go? I mean, that's the thing, right? So, well, because I mean, essentially, she says, "I will, I will turn over the keys. I'll basically throw open the doors to to the kingdom." So that's again right. stage setting for next season. Again, power that she doesn't have to do after her her second born son kind of gives hands her the dish towel and says back in the kitchen you know yeah yeah it'll be interesting no to offense see. to women but that's what he does well that's, say, that's basically. essentially what he says yeah i mean yeah. it's oh no i you know sided with the misogynist i can't believe they're being misogynistic like oh, yeah. Yeah. amazing how that worked out um yeah. i and think you raised him. it'll be interesting to see what happens next season obviously because the deal that they basically came to is i will throw open the doors for you and Rhaenyra says, cool, I'm going to behead Aegon. And and Allison reluctantly says, OK, you know, if that's what it takes, at least the rest of us will, you know. Well, cause I, I love the point that she makes, you know, she says, you realize that for in order for this, this debate to end, I have to kill your son. Yeah. And she right? and she does agree to it. But what is going to happen in season three when if this comes to pass and she shows up at the gates of King's Landing and Allison throws open the doors and says, oh, by the way, Aegon left. Yeah. Is Rhaenyra going to be like... So the the question, too, is did she know that he left? or did, I mean, because I know they kind of skulk off under... I get the feeling the that was actually... just That was kind of between Laris and, and Aegon. I don't, I don't get the impression there was anyone else in on that deal because it seemed like... Laris has kind of been working the king the last few episodes. Well, you know, yeah, I'm I think, the only well, one who Laris gets has it. been working. He's been working whoever's in control, right? Well, so. he has, and he realized he can't do it to Aemon, right? Because Aemon basically spike volleyed him like a volleyball uh, a couple episodes back, and was like, "You're a lick spittle, and I want nothing to do with you." And he's like, "Okay, I'm gonna go check in with my homie the king and see what's going on." Well, because the, the king, when the king was whole, he did say at some point, you know, I, I, my father never needed a master of whispers, but I think I do, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, we'll uh, have yeah. to see how that turns out. We'll you know? see. Uh, yeah. We'll see what, what uh, comes of it. And uh, yeah, we'll check in with Jaime when uh, we return for our next season. In uh, But in terms of feels, while. in terms of feels, right? Like, I mean... You know, um, Aegon and, and Laris kind of skulking off into the night. I don't care, like, what happens to them now, right? I mean, whereas I kind of do wonder what happened to Rhaenyra's first husband who goes off to wherever he goes off to. Um, but in the same sense that, you know, when when um, Maisie Williams' character um, leaves and goes and studies with uh, with that guy to... to uh, oh, the house they're undying, the, yeah. Or the, no, it's the faceless, faceless man, right? Yeah, the man who has no face or whatever, yeah. him. I love that character. But um, he's kind of like a Carlos Castaneda's kind of, you know, um, guru. But And and um, and the, the journey of Brienne, of Tar, right? She kind of like just, you know, her sort of wanting to be, you know, a knight and not being able to be a knight because they were a very mis- misogynistic society, mm-hmm. right? So, well, and even, even though she, one of my favorites was the Hound, right? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His his sort of. I mean, all these sort of arcs. I mean, like they had all these arcs that you're interested in. I mean, I'm interested in the, in the Matt Smith character. I'm interested in. I'm interested actually interested in the in the young lord who's you know inherited the what's his name now the one that, oh. that inherited from his grandsire. Um, he's an interesting character. Um, Laris is an interesting character, but but you know I, I care more about Laris than I do about oh and and the the white worm. I like her too. Yeah, you know. But in terms of in terms of like, I mean, not the liking liking. I mean, like, I but like the, the arcs that they're yeah. on, the stories that they're, they're on. Or well, and if, the, you, and if you'd asked me after season one, I would have said Kristen Cole is a very one dimensional, one note character, but he's come a long way too. Like, there's there's they, you know, that's the that's the catch twenty two of the season. There hasn't been so you much you've made, so I, I want to go back in on our own season here because you know a few episodes back you you really lit into him. Um, whereas from my perspective, he was kind of like, he was like her guard whose sworn duty was to protect her and, you know, to, and to be chased and all that kind of stuff as, as all of the, those guards are supposed to be. Right. Well, back up. Cause to her, one, are we talking about Allison or are we talking about Rhaenyra? Cause he was Rhaenyra's sworn sword first. 
Oh yeah, well he yeah, but he kind of he kind of gets. Does he have a, he has a relationship with both of them, right? Well, he sleeps with Rhaenyra, and then yeah, he is basically more concerned with his with his honor in the end, and is basically like, well, we have to run away together. And he she's like, no, I'm the queen. I'm not running away with you. I but why don't we just keep up our our relationship? And he's like, no, you besmirched my honor. And then he proceeds to murder a queer character in a at the queen's wedding how in the world he doesn't like that part is different from the book in the book he kills the same character but he does it during a celebratory tournament he goes too hard and he kills this guy and yes they're the same sort of illusions that maybe he killed him for a reason but it's not like in the middle of the queen and and prince or the princess and princesses wedding feast which is what it is in the show if he did that there's no way even viserys who is non-conflictory wouldn't be like okay that guy's got to die today yeah but so back me up on that he kills that guy because he comes on to him right no he what... kills that guy because that guy comes over and basically says i figured out your secret you're sleeping oh, okay. with the princess i'm sleeping with right. the prince and you and i right. should be buddies because we have a vested interest in the two of them being happy and Kristen is oh, yeah, so but, yeah, angry. He, at, yeah, he he wipes the floor with that guy. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. so angry Literally. that he feels like his honor has been besmirched. That he mm-hmm. basically murders uh, this is Joffrey, who is Lenor's uh, lover, and then he's about to kill himself in the Godswood. And that at the end of that episode, and Allison says, "No, don't do it." And then the two of them become buddies, and he decides, "Oh no, I'm going to swear my sword to the queen," and so he does that instead, and then. Of course, being the hypocrites that they both are, once Viserys has died, the two of them end up in bed together and end up having a relationship. So he betrays his his position again. But worse than that, and it it was one of the best lines that we didn't talk about from this episode is when Rhaenyra says, you know, uh, Allison says basically like, you did the same things I did. And Rhaenyra says, yeah, but I didn't hold myself up as this paragon of virtue and then do it i never said i was perfect you have been sitting around wearing the seven pointed star of you know the the gods and painting yourself as this virtuous person and then doing all this stuff you're a hypocrite and that's exactly what Kristen is too that's that was my point a few episodes ago is that both of them are huge hypocrites right yeah i don't know i i, I don't think he's a good person i genuinely don't um i think he I think he's had an epiphany since, and they've done a good job. And again, credit to the writers and credit to Fabian Frankel as the actor who who portrays Kristen. I think they've brought him around to being a much more compelling character in the second half of this season. But that doesn't change the fact that he's also just an absolute monster. He, you know, he is a murderer. He is doing things out of petty vengeance, and and he is, you know, not a good person. He just happens to have found himself in a situation where he's realized oh i've been part of opening this door and now i can't close it and we're all screwed right right want to talk a little uh little uh time bandits yeah let's talk about time bandits so two more episodes this week we got episodes uh five and six so we got episode five which was georgian and then we got episode six which is uh menace musa which was the um that's musa that's the uh the king that they meet the african king um good episodes they were you know they definitely are finding their rhythm i feel like they were funny they moved briskly the dialogue is sharp the visuals are good although this is sort of where the show is a challenge because they are going to do 10 episodes and we kind of know the end game of this based on having seen the movie but also we know the end game of this based on what they do they go from place to place they meet famous people and they uh interact with them and then they move on to the next place so the setup for this the first sort of two or three episodes are really kind of getting used to each other meeting the characters understanding what's going on and then we sort of settle into this middle run of you know episodes sort of three four five six maybe even seven where we're kind of just with the gang going on adventures getting to know who's who and what's going on and then we're going to build towards this sort of obviously the ending where they're trying to figure out, you know, um, what to do about uh, pure evil and and the supreme being. It's these were good and I enjoyed them. 
but it also felt like they didn't really move the plot forward a ton. No, and and it, well, I mean, there was a bit of a parallel for the Manas Musa uh, episode to the Sean Sean Connery character yep. and how yep. he wants to adopt Kevin, yep. right? Because uh, that kind of sort of does come up here. Um, yeah, and the 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 other one felt a little bit a little bit more. The Georgian one felt a little bit. I think probably just having seen Doctor Who do the same thing. Yeah. That sound, that reminded me of a Doctor Who episode. Yeah, it did it, 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 right from the last season. You're right. Yeah, well, not just not just from that last scene, but that's kind of thing, you know, like because Doctor Who travels through time and meets these famous people, mm-hmm. and like in this case, it's the Earl of Sandwich that they meet, right? <laughs> yes. Um, and and Kevin fact checks him, which I think is great, right? Yeah. Well, some uh, people and the whole think. and the whole thing about the duel. That actor, I gotta, I actually gotta pull up that actor because he's he's in quite a few. He's in uh, he plays um yeah Sherlock. Doesn't he, he play Sherlock's brother? Yeah, yep. Mycroft, right? Yep. Um, but he's he's a pretty big name to have in if, from a Britain as British actors go to have in an episode, right? So that's kind of a that's kind of a get, right? Yeah. I'm just calling up the episodes here. So that's Mark Gaddis, and yeah. Mark was actually one of the co-creators of that um, of the Sherlock BBC show with Benedict Cumberbatch, and Martin Freeman, and he also played Mycroft Holmes in that as well. Um, yeah, he's a very f- well-known British actor and also a screenwriter and also, um, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, he was in Game of Thrones. He's been in all kinds of stuff. He's one of those that guys for us, but he's actually really well-known over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the guy who plays the, that uh, lord that's in... Have, um... Aaron Hall. Oh, remember, yeah. Aaron Hall, yeah, he's a pretty famous Sir actor. Sir Simon, too. yeah, well, he's a, he's a real, uh, he's a real knight, he's a, re- a real member yeah, of the yeah, he's a knight of the realm, as it were. Yes, yeah. Yeah, he even gets the shout out in the, uh, in the uh, credits, I think they refer to him as Sir. Do they? Oh. Well, he's an actual knight. He's, he's actually, show. he's playing a Sir, and he is a Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Good casting, cool. good casting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it, it definitely enjoyable show, um... I don't know. I still, I, I still find the actual time bandits in the movie to be more fun because they were they were all about. I mean, they do bring up the whole idea of stealing a lot in this in this thing, but but I mean that was the purpose of the of the the time bandits in the first movie was that, you know they got the map so they could go and pillage right mm-hmm. right so because um, I guess they didn't get paid enough to to make flowers or whatever it was that they, their <laughs> yeah. assignment was right. Yeah. I liked. Yeah. Um... I like that the show is is playing with our expectations and subverting things. I, I you know obviously we started with that early when they you know they go to uh, visit um, the ancient uh, I can't remember was it uh, Mayans or Aztecs that they they visited with and they're like oh they're going to sacrifice you like yeah no but history's written by the victors and the conquistadors wrote the history and actually these people are really cool and it was the same thing where they they even go out of their way in this one where it's uh you know Lisa Kudrow's character sort of says you know we'll use Kevin to bore them to sleep and then they'll be so bored and Kevin goes in and starts talking to them and they're like you're the most fascinating person in the world Kevin <laughs> yeah yeah uh, you should come live here yeah yeah like i like that they are very much much playing uh, subverting you know setting up and then subverting all these expectations you know they go to uh when it's like it was episode four where they go to um you know medieval england and mm-hmm. you know they're oh you know dragons and dragons and you know and then of course they're they're again messing with our expectations which is really uh really good so except for kevin who brought in the big Film. Except for Kevin, Film. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's it's a it's a good show, and I like it a lot. Um, I you know, it's it's certainly very enjoyable, and I think that there's lots of fun character moments and everything else. I as I say, I'm just in this stretch. I'm trying to just enjoy it for what it is. But you're right; it kind of feels like the middle episodes of a Doctor Who season, where you're like, okay, but in the long run, do these episodes really mean much? Like, could you cut four of these episodes out and have a pretty concise? story and yeah you know again part of the part of the enjoyment is the journey not the destination but these are definitely the journey episodes yeah yeah definitely yeah but because i mean but the thing about it is like the time bandits movie the original story you know they do they do visit all these famous places but they do get to a point where you know there is the big battle between the two you know supreme beings right Mm -hmm. um you know which and 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 the the big giant maze thing at one point too. Sorry, my dogs decided to go and yell at the universe. <laughs> anyway, um, I'll try not to let it bother me. But yeah, should we move on to our watch list? Sure, let's let's bring it in. All right. So I um, 
Yeah, we, we Jonathan and I got together to sort of do an experiment with my Vision Pro to see what would happen if one logged in, if he logged in on it, what, what access would he have to movies and things. So I was able to sort of watch Inside Out as a, re, as a result of that in 3D, mm. which was kind of cool. But what, what really bothered me about Inside Out, I mean, I know it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be educational about, you know, emotions and how various emotions make us feel and things like that. But I actually found it kind of disturbing as a show because knowing what I know about, you know, the way the brain works and the way the mind works. And at one point, the, the main character who is, who's emotional, emotions these people are or these uh characters are controlling they lose a lot of her like she like she's moving bordering on psychosis like because she's losing grip on some of the realities that make her who she is right through you know the the adventures and the so i I found that very very strange and very disturbing it it, it is a little bit i think you're you're definitely it's a Uh, definitely one way to look at it but she's also i think the idea is that she's in this transitionary moment in her life right where some of the childhood things are being kind of crumbling inside her mind and being replaced with you know anxiety being replaced with you know uh sadness and you know i think when you watch that whole thing i think it comes around to being you know you do lose parts of yourself as you move move through your life, but some of those are things that are best left behind, and some of those things are obviously sad that they're gone. But you're not really aware they're gone either, right? Well, I mean, at the, the end of it is is that Joy, who's the Amy Poehler character, mm-hmm. um, Joy realizes that there is room for sadness, and she keeps trying to avoid sadness from touching things, right? And and spoiling them, but but um, they do realize that they work better together with a little bit of joy and a little bit of sadness. Sort of that sort of like you said that yin and yang of life, right? Yeah, yeah. I must admit, I'm really curious to see part two. I, I I don't think I'm a big enough fan to go see it in the theater, but well, there was a big puberty button which they didn't they didn't press, right? So... Yeah, and and obviously that's the kind of stuff they're going to deal with in a, in the sequel, which is as we just talked about last week, is is doing gangbusters box office business. I'm yeah. sure it'll pop. The question, the question soon. I have those who. I mean, I would assume that the audience for this is young children, right? Like, I, I, I think it's like most Pixar eight or nine things. Year olds. Yeah, but I think it's like most Pixar things. I think it works on a lot of levels. Like, that's I think what has always been the magic of Pixar is that you're right. I think you could show this, you know, to uh, to my niece who's nine, and I think she would get some stuff out of it, and I think she'd find entertainment and and understand some of it. But I think I can watch it as a person who's fifty years old and get something out of it. And I think you know, I think it just depends on you know you know what what layer you're looking at right because there there is you know again there's some some pretty funny just goofy you know the, the lewis black as anger and you know there's some you know uh mindy mindy kaling as disgust you know there's some very funny parts of it as well it's not and the all... imaginary the imaginary creature too oh bing bong friend. yeah yeah bing bong yeah richard kind is bing bong and he's so good um, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I really enjoyed. It. I, I didn't see that one until after it had come out for a while. I, did, I don't recall the circumstances, but I didn't get to see it when it was originally released. I saw it probably a year later, and I was very mm-hmm. struck by it. I thought it was a very, very well done movie. Yeah, cool. And then, uh, so I started watching. So I think I mentioned to you the other day that that uh, I just discovered that Orphan Black has been on AMC for the last little while, and and I, you know on the weekends they they kind of do these end to end where they just play one episode after the other. Mm. Um, and we're only halfway through the season. I think there's 10 episodes. I probably could look it up on the IMDb app while I'm talking. But um, so I managed to, so I started watching it and it, it just sort of like landed on, I think on episode three or four. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, let me just look around on my rod because I have a Rogers cable TV. So I went and looked and see what, what's in the archives for, you know, the on-demand stuff. And and I looked around and and they were showing the new episode was coming out, but they were showing the last week's episode before that, which is when I kind of flipped the channel and found it. So then I went and went and, and I explored around and I managed to find all six of the episodes and get them loaded up on my PVR so I could sit down and watch them like Jaime style, you know, end to end. Um, we're still we still haven't got the end of them yet. Um, but it's an interesting, interesting, uh, series because it, it, uh, I, and I was trying to find the glue that kind of holds everything together and you don't really discover this probably until like the third or fourth episode, but Kira Manning is one of the characters. And if I had known, if I'd heard her name, I might've went, Oh, wait a minute. That's, isn't that who, you know, what's her name? Um, cause Kira uh, Manning is Sarah Manning. Sarah Manning is the main clone in the original Orphan Black, mm-hmm. right? Uh, played by Tatiana Maslany, amazing performance as all the various clones, because you you would swear they're different people. Mm. Um, 
but Kira is her daughter. She actually has a daughter. And, and um, so Kira is, in this story, is now grown up. And she's become a scientist and, and develops a cloning technology, right, to, to clone organs for, uh, you know, like liver replacement, kidney replacements, that kind of stuff. And, and her partner, who is the, um, who's the girl now, that the main character, Christian... Uh, the main actress, Christian, help me out. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know who you mean. It's the, the one from um, from that show, with from those Breaking people. Bad, and from Jessica Jones. Uh, I'll look it up. Christian Ritter. Christian Ritter. Um, that's right. Christian yeah, Ritter. we're we're trying to we're, like because that's kind of sort of who you think is the main star of the show. But what's interesting is there's, there's another. So she, so the Christian Ritter thing is we're going to discover what what the deal is with her. Cause she's kind of like in the, in the original orphan black, Sarah Manning doesn't know she's a clone until she sees someone who looks exactly like her jump in front of a subway train mm. in the first episode, by the way. So not a big spoiler. Um, and that's when she realizes, Hey, what's going on? And it turns out that that, um, that woman that kills herself was a police officer who she then discovers is you know, down the street for me is, is the orphan black police station. I've got it marked on my, on my map here um uh, on king on the uh, on queen street there is where they film that but um or eastern avenue i think it is anyway but it doesn't matter uh they she discovers she's a clone like she doesn't know she's a clone right and sort of and sort of the christian ritter character is a clone and doesn't know she's a clone and starts to unravel all these pieces it's kind of a mystery thing to sort of put it together right and and so there's, the, and it flashes forward and back to sort of tell the story of, of this character, Kira, Kira Manning, who's a scientist who develops this stuff. And of course, you know, there's a big, you know, um, corporation that takes away the technology and does other stuff. They also discover that there's another, another younger um, person named Jules who looks a lot like Christian Ritter, the actress, right? And is meant to be a teenage version of the same clone right mm. they're both and they discover they're both printed right? i'm not giving too much away there's probably in the first two or three episodes you'll find that out but which is interesting was so i look, kept looking at this kira man the, woman, the adult woman who plays the adult the older version of of kira manning and and it turns out she is an actress named keely hawes who i kind of wondered like i kept looking at her going how do i know that person like who is she she's right, in ted lasso me, right? Was she Ted Lasso? Yeah, but she's also she's also one of the voices of Lara Croft, and as you know, I played tons oh, yeah. of Lara Croft games, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But she played Di Alex Drake. I've talked about um, the two um, British TV show cop shows about that are um, based on David Bowie uh, songs, right? Mm. Life on Mars mm -hmm. and Ashes to Ashes. Life on Mars is about a, a cop from today who ends up in 1975 Britain as a as an inspector. Right. And has to deal with all the sort of like the way the world worked back then. Mm -hmm. right? And he has to work his way towards coming to come. He gets I think he gets a brain injury or something like that. And he, so he lives. He survives his brain injury by reliving as a as a, an inspector in the 70s. Right. Mm -hmm. And then. But D.I. Alex Drake is the next series called a Ashes to Ashes. I highly recommend both of these shows, by the way. Um where she's a female officer in a 1990s police station. Mm. And of course, you know, with all the misogyny that goes on there, like most of her undercover roles is she's the, you know, the street walker who mm. has to get, you know, catch the perp because God forbid she should be a proper detective, or even though she's a de detective inspector, which is what DI stands for. I mean, I found out last couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, um, or from Black Echoes. It's a it, just coming back to that. It's it's similar to a uh, similar feel to. Remember Continuum? Did you ever watch that one? No, I never watched that one. Yeah, so it's it got us. It's got a sort of you know um, t made for TV sci-fi, but not not your NBC, ABC, you know, uh, CBS style. Um, it's it's much you know it's sort of a space channel yeah, it's kind of Stargate, amc plus uh, doctor who -y, stargate -y kind of thing yeah i mean those are kind of cheesy too no? i mean it's it's um i mean it's worth watching i mean it's 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 uh, intriguing there's a lot of wait a minute hang on a second what yeah. you know like like you clone somebody they wake up and they've got they know how to speak they got like a university education they know all this stuff like where when did they print that part of the brain you know kind of mm -hmm. thing right 
So yeah, so it, it's but it, it's based on cloning. Like they basically are clo- they're printing these cloned people basically from from a copy of an actual original person who lived at some point, right? So theoretically, if they're they're the whole theory behind a clone is you you like the dog you had, so you clone it to get a second dog like that. But I don't know that. I mean, they know enough about brain chemistry and the way it works and stuff like that that. You you know both of your children are not alike, right? Like I don't have to explain that to you, right? Yeah, I'm well aware. <laughs> Even though technically they are more or less very close to being the same person, as, right? as are yours, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so yeah, but I mean that that's the reality. The reality is I've learned about the brain brain the way the brain works and the way memory works and stuff over the years to learn that no two people working in an office are the same, no two salespeople are the same, no two artists are the same, no two hockey players are the same, you know kind of thing right but you know so the but the theory behind cloning is there's this mystique around the fact that they're going to be identical and and they very rarely are but um but that's that's the conceit that you have to sort of you have to dis- suspend that disbelief to to watch this show kind of thing right because how did they come out fully for, how come they come out with like you know five years worth of hair growth and even though they just got printed five minutes ago you know kind of thing <laughs> well then, now we're into star wars cloning it's starting to get a little mixed up yeah 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 yeah, yeah exactly Exactly. Like you, you can't. I mean, what I'm saying though is, if you if you take the genetic material that makes one person and make another person or dog or or horse or sheep out of that same material, you, I don't think you. I from what I know, I don't think you get the same person or the same 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 entity. You get the same like it's like twins. Like twins are are more or less they're from the same egg. In fact, mm-hmm. right? And, and the, the type what the type of twin I'm talking about is the one where the egg splits, right? Mm-hmm. Um, although they've both got two different. Um, uh, sperm donors, but her sperms making them, but they're more, they're, you know, that's how you get identical twins. They're never identical in terms of people. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So interesting, interesting show. I mean, and of course, you know, I've got a 3d printer, so I'm always interested in that kind of technology. <laughs> yeah. Not that I'm going to print any organs anytime soon, but <laughs> if you do let me know, I mean, I could, yeah, yeah, it could be a yeah. good one. You could use a third layer. Could you? Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you never know where you're going to need that extra kidney. Yep. Over to you. Yeah, so uh, a couple things I watched, a couple things I'm looking forward to watch. So I watched a mini series on Netflix that I was curious about called A Good Girl's Guide to Murder uh, that came out uh, last weekend here. Uh, it was a BBC, C, uh, BBC and Netflix co production, and it had already aired on the BBC. Uh, Is it a series or a movie? It's a mini series. So it's six okay. episodes, 45 minutes a piece. So the whole thing is over pretty quickly. It's just a little over four hours. Uh, which is, I think, the right amount of time to spend on this particular story. Uh, it kind of has a Veronica Marsy kind of vibe in that it is about a teenage sleuth in high school who is trying to piece together this who who done it this who who killed this person in this small town. There's a story. The basic premise is there's a young woman who uh, was has gone missing, presumed to be murdered, and her boyfriend uh, confessed to the killing and then killed himself and she knew them even though they were 5 years older than her she knew them from school and she just never it never sat right with her so she decides for a school project to start working on trying to see if all the truth of the case is out there and basically the show is that it's her trying to you know piece together all these pieces to figure out what actually happened to this girl what actually happened to her boyfriend is he really the killer and all that and it's you know and it serviceably tells that story it's it's a good you know little who done it it's a little thriller it's set in this little town it's a fictional town in england where you know again you know the community you'd never think there would be a murder in a community like this you know so it, it kind of plays on the tropes of of those kinds of stories um what really elevated it for me was the young star. So um, we got the main role played, uh, the main role is a, a character named um, uh, Pippa, and she is played by Emma Myers. And Emma Myers was Enid on Wednesday. So I don't know if you ever watched the Wednesday mm, series. Right, yeah. She's yeah. The, the werewolf girl that shares the room with Wednesday, sort of the... Yeah. The yin yang, yeah. Always, always positive. Always positive. Attitude. She's got the blonde hair. She's really, you know, excited. She's, you know, she's the opposite of Wednesday. 
Um, and and I, I really enjoyed her performance in that. So when I saw that this was coming on, I like a good little quick whodunit. And I thought, oh, I really liked her performance. You know, I'll take a chance. She's great. She's really, really good as the lead. Um, and definitely carries the the load of the series as the star really good supporting cast too lots of stuff to enjoy there so if you're looking for something again this doesn't really fit into the sort of sci-fi ishness of us uh but a good just sort of nice summer watch a nice easy whodunit not too gory although there are some adult subjects in there so i don't know it's great for too young of an audience which is funny because it's about a high school character but they do talk about you know sexual assault they do talk about drug use they do talk about some of that stuff so it, it can get a little dark but it was really enjoyable and uh apparently this was a trilogy of books that have been turned into this so if it is received well and right now i think it's got like an 86 or 87 on rotten tomatoes uh if it gets the viewership they can come back and do a couple more of these too so uh yeah i'm, I'm uh i would recommend that one i like that one a lot um i watched the first couple episodes of batman caped crusader which we talked about last week that's the new animated series that is on amazon prime um i enjoy what i watched so far it uh i've only watched the first three episodes i guess um they've you know taken some liberties they they sort of you know they're pushing the story forward um they gender swapped a couple characters which is always interesting and and certainly you know i have no issue with that so that's fine um the only thing that about it that really, really bothers me is that in so many previous incarnations of Batman over the years, there's this strong bond between Batman and Bruce and Alfred. And in this one, for some reason, they insist upon having both Batman and Bruce call Alfred Pennyworth, which is his last name. You know, Pennyworth, do this, Pennyworth, do that. And I'm like... He just comes off as a jerk, <laughs> and I don't like that part. Maybe it'll tweak. Maybe that's just something they're doing. But uh, yeah, that one, it's just that one thing is kind of sitting a little wrong with me. But again, I'm, I have not finished it yet. Maybe that turns, and, and I, I won't mind as much. But um but yeah, it's 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 again, it's fun, it's bright, it does have a lot of echoes of the 1990s animated series, if you're a fan of that. Certainly worth a look, and uh, I'll report back. And uh, when we we, we we come back for our next season, I'll, I'll update you on the, the remainder of that. Uh, Umbrella Academy season four just dropped on Netflix. That's my next watch. Uh, only six episodes to wrap up the story. Uh, whether or not that is enough, I don't know. Uh, but I am definitely going to jump into that, and uh, we'll be coming back with a uh, wrap up of that when we return next. And one other thing I wanted to flag was uh, I have been watching this YouTube channel, um, these animated videos by this duo called Kaz and Junaid. Uh, I'll have the link in the show notes. Um, so it's Kaz, C-A-S, and Junaid, J-U-N-A-I-D. They do these very funny, very quick recaps of famous movies. So Star Wars, Avengers, all these kinds of things. And they do it very firmly tongue in cheek. Uh, you know, they make light of, of of a lot of the situations, but they're actually also fairly faithful in that they show you a lot of the scenes. They do take some liberties for just for having fun, but they have a very distinctive animation style. There's uh, no dialogue in them. They just use sort of sound effects and, and little goofy voices and stuff like that uh, to make, you know exclamations and, and onomatopoeia but it uh they're fun they're super fun i fell down the rabbit hole i was telling tim i fell down the rabbit hole of those uh, a few days ago and ended up watching a couple hours worth just because they were so silly and so funny uh so i would recommend if you're looking for a bit of a uh a bit, a bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek poke at the the things that we all love so much the star wars and the, the marvel movies there's a great one that they do a, a good recap of uh, Deadpool one and two that is is definitely worth a watch. Very funny. Um, yeah, uh, if you're looking for something just to to sit back and turn your brain off and have a laugh, uh, I definitely definitely recommend having a look at those ones. I do recall posting some of these to the to our Slack channel a while back too. Now that you mention it, because I think there's one on there's one on Force Awakens and there's one on yeah, and the, all the, there, all the there are Wars. the like how it should have ended. And there's there's a bunch of people that do these kinds of things online. But uh, like I said, this one you know they recap the entire Star Wars. Movie 
movie in like four minutes, but it's just it's just a fun, goofy four minutes. And and but uh, their approach to how Darth Vader you know squishes people is quite quite different. Right? <laughs> yeah, more like think pop cans as opposed to uh, slow jokes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, it's good. It's really good. Yep, enjoyable. Cool. Well, I guess that's it for another week. So if people were in touch with you, where would they find you? You can find me on the uh, Twitter and the uh, Instagram is at JPK News, or you can find me on YouTube at youtube.com slash at JPK. Cool. All right. My name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A, and that's where you'll find me on the Twitter machine, on the Instagram machine, on the Mastodon machine. And all that kind of stuff. What about that threads and, machine? What about that threads machine there? Oh yeah, the threads machine. Yeah, of course that one too. That's the one I'm enjoying the most these days. So it's lots, lots of hours spent uh, watching silly things on on that and posting them to our Slack channel. When I find them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I forgot where the season started. I let's scroll back I, and have a look. I feel like it went maybe when it was the previous season of Discovery or something, like a long ways back. Uh, let's see. I think probably. Uh, oh no! This episode twenty-three was a long time ago. September eighth looks like no, it can't be. Um, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Mm-hmm. Oh, rawhide. <clears throat> We're down to oh, season six was episode 14 and we are at what are we at season six let's see what we were talking about things jpk jp the foundling hmm that what show Mandalorian? Was that? yeah second season maybe third season i can't remember uh, yeah i can't, I can't remember my titles. okay we're coming we're getting close i i sent something elusive <laughs> elsewhere Okay, actually, and here we are, six season, six season six, episode one. We were talking about in the main show, Star Trek Picard season three, episode one. Woof. So that Woof. was like a year ago, January. Yeah. Yeah, the Bad Batch. We were talking about season two, Bad Batch. The Last of Us, we were still talking about that. Yep. Did and that's when we did our last Spocky. So yeah, it would have been January. Did you, uh, did you see the little teaser trailer they put on HBO uh, after House of the Dragon this week? No, no. They they put a little like this is, is it on the crave. Uh, no, it was only on. Uh, you can see it on YouTube. Um, okay, but it's basically like what's coming to HBO in twenty twenty five. So they they showed like twenty five to thirty seconds of a few different shows. So the they showed twenty five seconds of uh, a Night of the Seven Kingdoms. They showed another twenty seconds of uh white lotus season three and then they showed another 20 seconds of the last of us season two so there is a brief just they show you like you know five or six quick cuts of different scenes and then you get a close-up on um uh, what's his name the lead character and and uh he plays he basically says like one thing and then they're like coming in 2025 last of us season two so so we know next year will be a good one because we are already on tap for, uh, yeah, for that. We're going to get our next season of Strange New Worlds. We're going to get our next season of Last of Us. We're going to get our first season of Knights of the Seven Kingdom. Uh, so, yeah, lots of stuff to look yeah, forward and to. And the second, the second game of Last of Us, I think, is two, two different stories, right? 
Uh, I haven't played. I haven't played the second game yet. Oh, you haven't? Oh, yep. spoilers. Yep. Nope. Uh, yeah. you're, you're ahead of me. Yes, sir, Bob. All right. Anyway, you got to go find out what the dogs are up to. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Um, yeah. Talk to you later. Sounds good. See ya. Okay, bye. bye.